Hello and welcome to Cranfield University. In this interview series, we explore the role of philosophy and humanities more broadly in management, engineering and adjacent disciplines. My name is Andrei Pavlov and I'm Professor of Strategy and Performance at the School of Management. Hello, my name is Toby Thompson. I'm director of this wonderful studio and my interest is in executive education. And today our guest is Emma Swin, the co-founder and co-CEO of the Philosophy Foundation here in the UK. Emma, welcome. Welcome to Cranfield. Hi there. Hi there, both of you. Thanks for having me. Toby, why don't you kick this off? <laughs> Emma, it's fantastic to have you with us today. I've got to ask, what is the Philosophy Foundation? <laughs> well, that would be a good place to start, wouldn't it? <laughs> the Philosophy Foundation is a charity based in the United Kingdom. Uh, we train uh, philosophy graduates and teachers to do philosophical inquiry in schools and other education spaces. So we train facilitators and then send them into uh, different places to facilitate philosophical conversations with groups of people, as well as one-to-one -one situ uh, situations with adults. So we work in schools, we work in prisons, we work in hospital schools, we work in business, we work in communities, we work in any space <laughs> where we think a philosophical conversation could help. And have I got that right that it's principally disenfranchised people or people that so far haven't had exposure to philosophy? Absolutely. That's our focus. Our main focus is on the disadvantage. So those children who don't get those dinner conversations necessarily uh, at home, those who aren't exposed to philosophy in their education system normally. So we work in primarily in state funded uh, education schools. Uh, we work in um, PRUs, which are pupil referral units and in um, young offender young offender institutions as well, as well as, as I said, yeah, hospital schools who so work at Great Ormond Street and um, and actually in, in a, a wide range of state schools as well. So we work in um, uh, schools with uh, religious backgrounds, but also humanitarian schools and schools with particular focus, a wide range, basically, any educational institution. Mm. I'm just curious, um, how, how did it start and how did it develop? Did you start working with the children and then sort of then it, the portfolio grew to include uh, the adults as well? Or did you start working with the adults and it went the other way around? How did no, how did it work? It, it worked. It started with the children. So when uh, Pete and I first met and we started talking about doing philosophy in schools, we were specifically saying that there's a there's a philosophy shaped hole in this in school education. There's no place for children to think for themselves to com learn to communicate properly. It's very um, force fed the education system as we saw it back then when we first started 20 years ago. So we wanted to create a space for children to explore big ideas, to explore things that matter to them and to the world around us, and to think how to, about how to learn properly. And we decided actually right at the beginning that we weren't gonna go in and do critical thinking or philosophy with A-level or uh, older students. We wanted to start right at the beginning because what we wanted to do was to help children to develop the right habits of thinking and learning. And you, if you do that from a young age, then it becomes much more embedded in the person rather than just something that they have to learn and think about on a more regular basis. So, you know, uh, we all know that the earlier you learn something, the more habitual it can become. So that's why we started off in primary schools. We started in key stage two, which is sort of upper upper primary school level. And it was working there and then and then Pete was asked if he could work with younger children and then we sort of went down slowly, slowly to nursery. <laughs> so now we work all the way up from, from nursery all the way up to A level. And then of course we started working with adults as well in the community because we believe that philosophy is important to everyone. And the more, more chance and opportunities you have to reflect and think either by yourself or with others is an opportunity to develop and grow and uh, learn new skills. Uh, oh, Bagsy next, because this is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. How, yeah. How, Emma, how on earth do you create the space in a school to do that? Are the teachers asking you? Are the kids asking you? How do you defend that space? Oh, well, that's a good question, Toby. It's um, f primarily it's the head teachers that bring us in. So we we get contacted by head teachers or by a senior leader who thinks that they want philosophy in their school, that they want a space to be created for this thinking to happen. Um, but sometimes we're contacted by parents 
sometimes we are actually contacted by students. We have had a number of um, emails from students who say, can you come into our school? Or can, you, can you work with us? Um, or how can we do this? I want, to, I, start, I want to start running a philosophy club. Can you give me resources and can you help me set this up? How do so they find out about, about you, especially the students? Uh, so uh, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> I think I think they were on, our, they're on they go to our website or they um, they read our books. So sometimes mm. we've found children um, picking up the If Machine, for instance, which is one of the first books that Pete wrote on doing philosophical inquiry in primary schools, although it's also um, applicable to secondary. And um, some children just pick it up and read it themselves, and then they want to try some of the things that they have in the book to um, to experiment on their friends yeah. <laughs> or on their on their family. Don't try this at home. Actually, do try this at home. Do try it at home, yeah. I've got to ask, you must be asked this all the time, do you prefer kids teaching philosophy to kids or teaching philosophy to adults? Or kids of what age? <laughs> well, I suppose we, I think that on the whole, people say that that where we started at key stage two, so aged eight to 10, is a really good age to do philosophical inquiry. In, in um, education, actually, there's some interesting research that says that, that shows that year four, so that's sort of uh, seven, seven and eight year olds, they actually don't progress much. It, there's, uh, most research that's done around that age group doesn't show much progression for any intervention. And I, I don't know why that is. It's, it's very odd. They're wonderful to work with, um, but but it's when you get to when you get to year five and six when they're sort of eight nine ten that's when their thinking really starts to kick off. Um, but we, as I said earlier, we work with the very early, very little ones, and they're very very cute, and they do some very very silly things. <laughs> but but it's actually really uh, wonderful to watch them develop those sorts of abilities to engage in a question to answer a question, to ask questions, to realise that they don't have to agree with everyone in the room, that they don't have to agree with the teacher, that their thoughts matter. Um, and that they could, you, you start, you know, even after a, you know, a year of working with nursery school children, you really do see a development. And we wouldn't necessarily say that you're doing philosophy at that mm. stage with them, but what you're doing is you're giving them the groundwork, the foundations for them to be able to grow and build and develop more fundamental philosophical skills later on. And but I, I like working to... with adults as well, sorry. Because <laughs> I think adults have this uh, interesting mindset where they, um, they, they sudden, it, once they're introduced to philosophy, first of all, people are like, well, you know, philosophy, it doesn't really mean anything and it's, mm. it doesn't help in the real world. And why are you talking about holes <laughs> in donuts and, you know, things like this don't really matter. And then they spot a problem. And when you see them spot a problem or you see them have a, a, an argument with someone else, I mean, a philosophical argument with someone else, not just a, a ranty one, you can see them start to realise that listening to other perspectives is helpful and helps them understand something about the other person, about different ideas in the world. And it also gives them a chance to step back and think about how, how their values impact on the world uh, as well as how other people's impact on the world as well. Mm. It's like no one's ever asked me that question sort of thing. That's a real gift that you're giving people. <laughs> well, some, well, you know, it's Pandora's box, isn't it? <laughs> Open up and you don't know what's going to come out and what... what uh, it, it, it's interesting you call it a gift. I, I like that idea of it being a gift. Um, I, I wasn't exposed to philosophy until, uh, until I met Pete back in 2001. And that's when we sort of started talking about doing philosophy in schools. And for me, it was a sort of revelation, sort of, uh, we, I think we were talking about free will and determinism. And that conversation for me just sort of enlightened my being. And I, I don't mean that is I didn't become enlightened. I meant, I mean, it kind of invigorated my my thoughts around the subject. And I, I, so I was hooked. I was hooked from that, from that moment on, actually. Um, and I think, uh, I think philosophy is one of those, is the discipline, actually, is the one discipline that can cross between the sciences and the humanities and sort of bring them together to help them work things out together, to help people develop the skills on either side that need to be developed. Um, it, it's the, you know, it's the foundational subject. 
all all subjects come out of philosophy. So I think philosophy should be in every curriculum all the way through from nursery all the way up to higher education. And postgraduate education, education, exactly. I must say. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? What do you think your students get out of this uh, from children to adults? What's the what's the takeaway? I think so certainly for um, the younger students, um, the feedback we get from them is that, first of all, it's fun. <laughs> they like doing it. They It's a chance for them to think. That, that's been a comment that a lot of them have given. They like learning the critical thinking skills that we teach them, and they can see the importance of it, particularly in today's world with fake news and propaganda that they have to um, f fight against. Um, but I think it's also that reflection, that time for reflection within education, where they can consider everything they've learned, try to un unpick it and understand it, and to talk with others and their friends and hear their, their points of view as well. Um, we've had several students, uh, several older students now come back to us who've um, gone on to university and, and, and have done other things. And I think one of the things they talk about is that reflective space, that space to be able to challenge what they've learnt and to go deeper into it through the philosophical conversations. Can you just explain, uh, Emma, a typical intervention with, with the uh, seven or eight-year-olds or even younger? Are we looking at a series of PowerPoints or is it storytelling? What are you doing? Hopefully um, not PowerPoints. <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. Yes, we, we give them a copy of Immanuel Kant and expect them to read it <laughs> and then uh, analyze it and explain to us what, he, what he's talking about. <laughs> In an essay. <laughs> um, no, it starts, it's, it usually does actually start with a story. It is, it is story based. So we use thought experiments. We use stories that we've invented to, uh, to, to think about uh, ideas that we want to explore together. Um, sometimes it can just be a question. Um, you know, we we can we can just start with a question. So, give us instance, an example of a story or a question. Okay, so if I were to put uh, four twos on the board in front of you, um, and ask you the question, how many numbers are there here? What would you say? You ask the question, you answer it. <laughs> I would say four digits. Yeah, four digits, and how many yeah. numbers? How many numbers? Four numbers. Well, Eight. we would have to ask what a number is then. And I think already we can see what's happening yeah. is that we're thinking more deeply about it, which I guess is your point, Emma, right? Yeah, exactly. But I mean, the question, uh, question like that is called the two square. So we put four twos on the board and we say, how many numbers are there here? And, and actually, the first thing to do is to get as many diverse ideas as possible. So we ask them, you know, how many how many different numbers do you think you could find here? Um, so you obviously you get the there's one number, there's four numbers, there's of infinite numbers, there's no numbers, you know, the, all, all of all of this come up. And then, of course, you explore the reason behind why they've they've said one, two, four, you know, um, and, and that's when you get into the inquiry. That's when you find out about the reasoning and the uh, articulation of arguments towards, um, you know, from premises to conclusions. Um, but so, I mean, that's a fairly simple one, but you also have things like uh, our, our session on Republic Island, which is you're all shipwrecked, uh, you're all on a, a on a sh on a ship, and it's crashed into an island, and you've got nothing, um, and you've got to build your own society. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to elect a ruler. How are you going to do that? So you, so it's about democracy. It's about building society. It's about building rules. How are you going to live in this society? Who's going to who's going to judge what's right, what's wrong? Um, so it, it runs over several weeks and uh, and the, the children learn about society and democracy. Um, and sometimes we do teach them things about what uh, the democratic systems are and autocratic systems and uh, things, uh, all, all the sort of concrete things that we can teach. But our main rule in our philosophy sessions is to let the children explore the subjects for themselves. And we're there to perform a structural role to be able to get them to think clearly, to articulate their ideas well to one another and to um, to critically engage with each other's ideas. They sound completely applicable to a, a young audience or to an older audience, frankly. 
Yeah, we, we use exactly the same methods with, <laughs> with postgraduates and adults as we do with very young children. Um, yeah, exactly the same. And, that, and do you encounter cynics at the back of the room saying, oh my goodness, this is another hour of this. What's this got to do with my curricula or my issue if it were a business case? Uh, yeah, of course, M mainly with adults, <laughs> more than <Right>. children. <laughs> but um, but even children, you know, sometimes you'll you'll they'll sit there in the classroom with their arms folded and you know not wanting to join in and coats on and you know not not being engaged in the conversation. But then they will see something and they will go, uh, and you'll you'll see that they have something to say. And it's mm. it's those moments, those moments where you catch them, where they can't help but be engaged. So they they. You know, some kids love philosophy. Some kids take time to get used to philosophy. Others try to resist philosophy, but there's something about the nature of philosophy which is actually innately engaging. I think it's a very human thing to do. And uh, once you've found the pull, once you've found the the question, what is a number, then then you've got then you've got the sort of the fire, the kindling that that creates the conversation. It's quite interesting. I'm listening to you and I'm thinking that um, the way you are doing this and they, the way you're describing this is quite different from um, the kind of traditional approach to teaching philosophy in universities, for example, because if you had to take a class in philosophy, uh, as many of us have, um, you would be exposed to a, a number of ideas. It would be the history of philosophy. It would be the kind of different philosophical schools. It will be individual philosophers and uh, and so on. Whereas I think what you're doing, what you're focusing on, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is more kind of doing philosophy rather than learning about philosophy. That's absolutely right. Yes, it's about doing philosophy. It's about um, exploring the subjects that the philosophers ex themselves explored or exactly. philosophers explore themselves. Um, so, yeah, we're not presenting the history of ideas, although we can introduce the history of ideas through the philosophical inquiry, but we don't, that's not our starting point. Our starting point is to find out what the group think and, and what different members of the group think, because obviously all the, the different ideas, the pluralism of the, of the conversation is what then can, it, you can use to introduce all the pluralistic ideas that are in the philosophy world as well, because not all philosophers agree, funnily enough. <laughs> It's it's um it's a way of, uh, yeah, engaging people in the doing of philosophy rather than the learning about philosophy, um, and it it's through. It's, I remember classes we've run in the past where children have said certain things that resemble thing uh, other things that the philosophers have said, mm -hmm. and actually when you introduce what the philosophers said after they've already said it. So, oh, what Felix has just said then and what Florence has just said then is like Leibniz and and that's like, uh, you know, the Leibniz's monads and yes, yeah, so you're like Heraclitus with what you've just said. You know, and they got all excited and, you know, oh yeah, I said something that was, but do you know what, those ideas stick. Those ideas yes, stick course, in their because... mind much mm. more clearly and for much longer than if you're just told about what Heraclitus said or told about Leibniz's monads. <laughs> mm, because they <laughs> you know. have worked, worked it out themselves. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. Incredible. Emma, could you say, this is inspiring, can you say more about how you train facilitators to do this? That's quite a skill. Uh, it, it is quite a skill and it's an art form as well, actually, facilitating these conversations. So there are certain strategies and techniques that we teach on our courses but um, at the end of the day, it's when they go into the classroom and they start to have to naturalize everything that they've learned and start to work with the children and improvise. That's when the sort of the magic happens. So uh, we have a two day training course for our facilitators of philosophy. These are mainly philosophy graduates, but we also work with teachers and people who are just interested in philosophical inquiry. So some people who've come to us want to run philosophy sessions in their community, for instance, and you don't have to have a, a philosophy badge to be able to say that you uh, that you can do that. It, it's, you know, it, as I said, it's a human, it's a human thing to do to be able to philosophize together. We just want people to be able to philosophize well. And we think if you have a good facilitator in place, then it's easier to do than, um, than not. Um, 
So yeah, they come on the course. We first of all, we show them how we run a philosophical inquiry. So we run a session for them so they get to experience it themselves. They also then have to think about it from a meta stance. So they have to think about what it is the facilitator was doing. So we ask them, what did the facilitator do? What impact did it have? Did you notice anything? And that's when sort of some questions come out about that. Then we teach them about specific strategies that we have. Um, so one of the things that we talk about is absence and presence. So as a facilitator, we don't want your content to be involved in the conversation, uh, but we do want the structure of arguments to, to sort of be holding it all together. So we have to intervene when, when necessary, and but also remain absent when not. And it's that balance between absence and presence, which is the art of, of facilitation. So we, we train them in these techniques and these uh, strategies on, on sort of the second, second day, and then, on, and then we get them to practice. So there's quite a lot of practice that goes on in the, in the two, on the two day course, as well as some storytelling and some behavior management and all those sort of little bits that you have to do. Um, but then the, the real heart of our training comes in the classroom. So we send people into the classroom with a mentor and they have to, they, they run a session, they observe us in the classroom. So observation is really important. I think you have to see good facilitation and sort of recognize it and, and analyze it. And then you can start to sort of embed it in your own practice. So there's lots of observations and then they practice. And after five, five weeks or so, we go back and we have a look and see how they're doing. And that's how people become accredited uh, with us. What's what's their usual background? Who are your facilitators? So all of our facilitators who are specialist philosophy teachers are philosophy graduates. Right. So they've either got a BA or an MA or, or more in, in philosophy. They're individuals who've come to us because they want, they've also spotted the philosophy shaped hole in the curriculum and they want to bring philosophy back. In fact, two of our recent philosophy uh, trainees um, were primary school Ch ch children that we taught so they had philosophy with us in primary school they went to secondary school realized that they weren't getting philosophy as they wanted it went on to do university philosophy and then came back to us and went we want to do what you did <laughs> go into primary schools and do philosophy with with children because it was an inspiration and it taught them uh, a, a great deal about education and themselves so they wanted to give that back which was really nice to hear um, so yeah, mainly individuals who who love philosophy and want to do more of it and think and think it's going to help people, um, as well as philosophy graduates at university. So we work with a number of universities and train their graduates specifically to do outreach programs. Wow, I'm interested, Emma. You said a philosophy shaped hole in the curricula. You could have a skeptic saying, "If I only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail." What's your response to that? Um. I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, okay, I'm going to ask you, what, what, do you, what do you think that analogy means, Toby? <laughs> well, the three of us here are philosophers. Uh, we understand the benefit, we get the enjoyment from it. Someone from outside, and let's face it, the UK certainly, is a phenomenally anti-intellectual culture, I think it's fair to say, if you listen to George yeah. Orwell at least. Skeptical of elites and skeptical of experts and skeptical of these so-called philosophers. Well, you do, you would say that there's a philosophy's solution there, wouldn't you? Because you're a philosopher. That's the sort of uh, yeah, point I'm I mean, to make. Yes, of course. I, I mean, I would say that look, philosophy is not a panacea. Everyone learning philosophy is not going to make the world a better place. And, uh, you know, philosophy may not turn out good, uh, virtuous, ethical people. In fact, there's some evidence to show that perhaps it, it doesn't. But what I think... Uh, someone working in education, I think we need a more rounded education education system that isn't just focused on either STEM subjects. Actually, we focus a lot on STEM subjects now for, for very good reason, but you also need the skills of the humanities and you need the skills of being able to think and reflect. And actually philosophy gives you those skills. So why not use it um, in education, just as Socrates used it in the marketplace? You know, if you're going to uh, go and engage people to think about life, uh, do it through philosophy. Mm. And if I could kind of come to your rescue here, uh, 
Emma. Um, I think for me, the, the, the reason I'm doing this and the reason I'm doing it in Cranfield um, is because I think that um, similar to what you said, it, whatever we are pro whatever product we are providing for our, uh, to our students, um, if it's one-sided, if it only has one um, um, one side or one flavor of human knowledge, we can't really call it education. Um, yeah. And um, and we have to expand it to some to to other uh, fields of our knowledge, our our other forms of inquiry, be it through philosophy or humanities in general. Uh, but but yeah, because otherwise um, we are, I think, shortchanging our students if we're not doing this. Yes, I think so. In the same way that you know, I think music should be on the curriculum. I think all children should be ex exposed to music and drama and and the creative subjects as well. Um, so I'm not I'm. I am, I'm not just banging the philosophy drum, although I do think it's a really good subject. <laughs> <laughs> we love the drum that you're banging, so we're on your side. <laughs> Say more about the instrumental, but particularly more about the non-instrumental benefits from doing philosophy. Well, when we talk about the instrumental benefits of doing philosophy, you're talking about the impact it has on learning, I suppose, on, on, on cognitive abilities. Um, the so so we've done research with King's College London into the impact of philosophy on critical thinking skills and metacognition um and it's shown that the the method that we've used and the one that we've developed since really does improve children's ability to use critical thinking by 60 percent compared to a control group which had just we had normal philosophy in one and, and then we had our new intervention which, which included us teaching them about the critical thinking skills that they were using. Um, so th that obviously has an impact. Their, their metacognitive ability also improved um, through, through the programme that we're doing. And actually critical thinking skills and metacognition improved in the, no in the normal philosophy classes as well. So uh, it, it, does, it does work. The reasoning, um, the development of reasoning uh, works across uh, all forms of philosophy for children that have uh, been done around the world. There's lots of tests showing that. There were some tests showing that it impacts on reading and uh, numeracy skills, but um, the the jury's still out on that. So those are the instrumental things. That, you know, does philosophy help learning? Does it help the curriculum? Uh, it seems to, and it certainly doesn't impact badly on the on the curriculum, which is probably one of the most important things to say about it as well. But non-instrumentally, I think it's important to realise that children need a time to think. We all need a time to think. When you when you you have a busy instrumental curriculum that's driven by results, you need time to understand and unpick and think about it, and not not worry about getting something right or wrong, but just worry about the coherence of an argument or or how things fit together or sort of seeing things from a different perspective. And I think these are important aspects to humanity that we that you can get through philosophy. And it's also those social skills, those effective skills, that ability to communicate your thoughts and to understand the other. And I think that actually is really powerful in in today's society where we're so opposed we sort of take sides and we need to learn how to listen better to one another. And I think you can do that through philosophy because you have to listen to one another, because you have to be able to understand the other so that you can either agree, disagree or find a, a new way forward. I think I might be biased here, but I think you probably you probably see this more readily. Um, when you work with adults, uh, because uh, just because adults are in the in the context where you can where you can immediately see the improvement in the argument, for example, or you you can immediately see the the uh, the drop in the temperature of the argument, right? And so so you can see how uh, what what otherwise would have been a verbal fistfight um, suddenly becomes a, a cogent exchange of informed opinions, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. You were going to say something. I was going to ask you well, about your your courses for adults, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was going to say actually, we we see that we see that a lot in the classroom. So you know, a, a child will put forward a, a an argument or a point of view, and then another will say, 
or hang on, what about this? And and you'll see the other child either go, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that, or I, what I meant was this, rather mm -hmm. than um, necessarily jumping up and, and getting into a fight. Uh, I think the only time we've had a fight in the classroom was when the class had to be stopped because one ah. child was behaving so badly. And then one of the other children in the class mm. ran across the room and thumped him and said, you've ruined philosophy. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so so t do tell us about the, um, uh, the the courses that you do for adults as well. So you, you do have a course on, um, on argumentation, I think. I think it's called The Art of Argument. Yeah, we've got a uh, yeah a course starting tomorrow evening at uh, well okay. on Wednesday, Wednesday it, sometime in January uh, <laughs> on uh, called the art of argument and it's about uh, learning how to spot an argument how to spot a good argument how to realize when an argument is fallacious um, it's for people who you know you sort of you hear something on the radio and you think that doesn't sound quite right and you but you can't quite put your finger on it so th this course helps you to pinpoint what it is is it the premises is it the conclusion what is it that doesn't fit together you learn about we're learning about fallacies so they're quite fairly concrete things but we're doing it again through through dialogue th through you know interpretation through putting things up on the putting things up on the board and saying what do we think about this and then working together on, on figuring out what's wrong with it mm. this sounds um, so big emma it's, it's, it's almost societal we're, we're we're left with or we work with people that have come through the educational system and have usually haven't had the experience that you're talking about what you're talking about are life skills they're community skills they're huge yeah mm. absolutely um i'm very passionate about uh, community collaboration about um, helping society to become better. I'm quite politically driven in the, uh, although I don't like necessarily what's happening in our politics at the moment, I think engaging in politics is one of the most important things we can do as, as a society. We have to work together, we have to live together. And, but, but to do that, you have to understand each other and, and understand different, uh, uh, different perspectives. And, and I'm talking not just about the, the mental perspectives, but also, you know, what people are living through. We have to know what's going on in order to and, un, and, and to hear their stories rather than just making assumptions uh, uh, about how other people live. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very much driven by the idea that philosophy can help people to think about citizenship, how we should be living in the world today, how we can engage with each other and how we can help each other. Do you find yourself putting brakes on? Because you mentioned politics there. Um, I guess part of philosophy is being dissentful, is yeah. disagreeing, is not following rules. Yeah. Do you find yourself having to put the brakes on or it's, it's just let it go? Well, in the classroom? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have certain rules ourselves as as the facilitators, obviously. So we would, one of our rules, for instance, is that we don't step in and tell people what we think because that can ruin the conversation. So we have mm. our own facilitator rules, and obviously we have we also have the safeguarding rules of the school, and we have to follow follow those things. But uh, we do like to be provocative. We we do like to um, we sort of smile when a child says something that's <laughs> that could could cause trouble and sometimes actually you know when we run a session such as um, the ring of gyges so the ring of gyges is a story from uh, from plato where uh, a, a shepherd finds a ring uh, that makes him invisible and he puts on the ring and then he goes and he kills the king starts to rule the country marries the queen does some terrible things murders lots of people it's horrible and the idea behind the story is that if if no one knows that you've done it then would you then why wouldn't you do it so it's about you know mankind's ability to hide very much like social media right if no one can see you if no one knows who you are you control as much as you like should you then that is mm. the question and um when we do the ring of gyges in the classroom we stop you know, you, we tell them they, they found a magic ring. What would you do with it is the first question. What would you do with this magic ring that if you found? And they have to write down what they would do. And then they put all their answers in the hat because we don't want to sort of expose the children. <laughs> to, um, uh, and some of them come out with some, you know, t terrible things. You know, you would they would steal, they would take things, they would. Um, 
And it, if you do that in front of a, a teacher, you can see the teacher going, oh, that's terrible, you shouldn't do that. But the children need to say these things because what the next question is, what should you do as opposed to what would you do? And it's that difference. And, and then you've got to get them to mm -hmm. think about what the difference is between what you should do and what you could do. And why is there a difference there? And, and what are the reasons and what reasons do you have? And actually, this comes to a really important aspect of our work. It's about the, the difference between received and operational beliefs. So we are told to behave in a certain way from a very young age, you know, share, be nice, always do these things. And actually, sometimes people don't. People break the rules, sometimes for very good reason, and sometimes to make things happen for them that don't happen for others. But having these received beliefs, if you don't reflect on them and think about them, they don't ever become operational. They don't ever become part of who you are because you've been told not to do it and you won't do it but you know suddenly you're faced with an opportunity to do it and maybe you would whereas if you've thought about it and if you've reflected and if you've considered why it's important that you should or sh shouldn't do these things then it becomes much more embedded in you as a person so that's the difference between received and operational beliefs um, and you know, i think things like the the riots back in 2010 are a good example of that. There were lots of people who were, you know, good upstanding citizens who went out and broke the rules when they shouldn't have, and they know they shouldn't have, but they hadn't had an opportunity to think about mm. what they should do in, in these sort of circumstances. And certainly didn't have that space to, to, to stop and just think about, okay, so what am I going to do it? And should I do this? Yeah, exactly. Can I ask, have you seen over the years, Emma, that you've been doing this, you've been doing this quite a long time now, have you seen any trends in the audiences, either adult or children, where you can say, you know what, there used to be this, but now there's this? Or is that too too philosophical? Um, well, actually, I think it's too empirical. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure we have got uh, enough data to be able to say there's there's been a different uh, a definite change. I th I think certainly in, in today you know working certainly with teenagers there's much more awareness of things like you know trans issues um and issues to do with with gender and to do with um rights and responsibilities um so that's at the forefront and also of course nowadays it's free speech so there's been quite a big change in in the idea of free speech and what free the harm that the harm or non-harm or the importance of free speech um, in the society. But I think those are, the, you know, I think those are wider issues as well. They're not just uh, things that children are being exposed to. It's these are questions that are around us every day. You know, how much should we um, take on board when someone is giving their opinion? How do we, uh, how do we learn to live with a difference of opinion um, and accept accepting the other again? Um, so I'm probably waffling now. Mm. Can I actually, the, I was going to make the question even broader. Um, <laughs> so kind of reflect, reflecting on your um, experience with doing this, because uh, the foundation was, um, was started in what, 2007, 2008? Yes, uh, that's right, yeah. Um, so you've, you have been doing it for a long time. Um, what else have you seen more broadly um, over this period of time? For example, uh, I'm thinking of, is there a growing interest in philosophy in general? Um, is there a pushback? Um, do you feel that you are now pushing on to open doors, uh, whereas um, in the past you had to really try and bang uh, into those doors? In general, what what have you seen in this space over over these fifteen years, sixteen years? Well, yeah, um, over this time, uh, it has philosophy has become more popular, popularized. I know this country uh, when we first started, Toby. You know, uh, as you said earlier, you know, we we thought of the UK, England in particular, as being particularly um, bad at being intellectual, at, at, at the joy of intellectualism. Um, uh, so we thought we were told, don't call yourselves philosophy foundation, don't call yourselves the philosophy mm, something or other because, um, because people won't understand, they don't, you know, won't know what it is. And we said, no, that's part of what we want to do. We want to give philosophy back to the people, right? So this is something that everyone can enjoy and should enjoy. And it's a sort of a human quality that we have. 
um, and we just need to be able to do it well. And uh, so certainly when we first started, uh, there was a resistance towards philosophy. But now we've got philosophy springing up all over the place. You've got podcasts and you have uh, web web pages and you have magazines and you have new new philosopher magazines popping up all the time and new TED talks and YouTube TED, TikTok everything's doing everything's exploding in philosophy mm. <laughs> as it should be and that's a good thing. What, um, what do you make of it? What the the explosion this, explo this explosion of interests in philosophy. I think it's a, I think it's great. I think we still need to be careful about how we expose people to it. I think if you, you know, you, you can perhaps not, where, as, as we said earlier, if, if you're so into a subject that you, that you love it and you, you sort of, you can see its importance, it's very easy to forget how to see its importance. Mm. And to people who haven't been exposed to philosophy, they won't necessarily um, have that ability they'll just go well you're just talking about a hole in a donut what are you doing <laughs> and you're like well no because it's really important <laughs> that you think about this um, you so sometimes I think we have to explain why we're doing what we're doing we have to explain um, the importance of the question perhaps so for instance if you're talking about the ship of Theseus and the idea of a ship changing its parts over time and then thinking about the question, is it the same ship? The, the importance isn't in the, the sameness of the ship and what, what we call the ship. The, the, the important thing here is about identity through time. And are we the same person through time? What is it that makes us in the same person? Are you the same person when you're seven as you are when you're 40? What is it that, that keeps us together? And I think those sorts of questions can help people reflect and think and see. Um, uh, but uh, and working with adults, one of the things that the problems we have is that problem of the anti-intellectualism. I don't need philosophy. Philo I never had philosophy at school, so why do I need it now? Mm. It's not. It's not important. I've had, you know, I've had some friends say that to me, you know, why, why would I campaign to have philosophy in schools? I didn't have it. It didn't do me any yeah. harm. <laughs> As Douglas um, Adams but, says, you'll have a national philosopher's strike on your hands. Who's that going to convenience? <laughs> well, I bet we could cause some problems. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question about education, because I think some people watching this video may be thinking, well, Emma, you're an educationalist. You're a teacher. Um, with that hat in mind, what would you say are the responsibilities of teachers? Because my interest is in teachers and helping teachers understand the value of philosophy. What's the responsibility of a teacher that you, you would say? In, in educational context, yes, generally? Yes. Particularly in the context of this explosion of interest in philosophy, yes. I think. Well, okay, so it, in the context of um, education generally, I, I would say it's the same as as what we have in terms of what we want to do with philosophy, and that is to help the child to flourish, to help the student to flourish, to become the best person that they can. I think that's what education is for, to draw out, to help people become better, um, but also to help them think independently, autonomously, to create individuals who are able to think for themselves, to reason for themselves, to have, um, have their own thoughts, and to be able to guard against the problems that we're faced with now, particularly in terms of social media and, and fake news. And, but you know, these problems have always been here. We've always been, had problem with, with media, with our own society. How do you check the information you're given uh, from, the, from an external mm. part? In terms of um, teachers, uh, particularly in, in, in terms of the, the, the bringing of philosophy forward, I think, uh, I think teachers of philosophy need to let the children or the students think for themselves again. So I suppose it's the same thing. We can't just teach them how we think they need to do philosophy because philosophy mm. is about being outside of that. It's the, the rule breaker, the dissident. So you can't teach someone to be a dissident. You, you have to allow them to be a dissident. <laughs> Um, and you have to allow that um, problematization uh, on your own teaching, as well as on uh, your the children's learning, students' learning. 
And in terms of advice for people watching and thinking, you know what, Emma's onto something here. Where would they begin to get a curricula in place? I guess they could come to you, of course. Of course. <laughs> We've got lots and lots of curricula <laughs> and, and things that, that people want to use. Yeah, so um, there's a, a film recently out, uh, you might have heard of it, called Young Plato. And it's a film set in Belfast uh, in the Ardoin. And it's it's about the teacher there, Kevin McAreevy, who's, uh, who come and he came and he trained with us. And then he brought us over to train all of his teachers in, in philosophical inquiry. But then he has, he has been a dissident himself and he has sort of done something completely different with philosophy in his school. He's embedded it entirely across the curriculum. He has, every single year group has it. Uh, they have a philosophy wall where they think about, where they actually reflect on violence and uh, behavior rather than just philosophical issues. So they're, because he's working in the Ardoin, because he's working across the religious divide, um, and all the problems that they have in, in Northern Ireland, he's having to deal with these sort of cultural issues as well. So he's using the philosophy to be able to do that. Um, so I think in, in terms of advice for teachers, I think go where you want to go with it. So if you want to explore philosophy in your curriculum, read around, you know, what is it that excites you? What do you think is going to excite the, the students? What's going to engage them? We have a lot of resources on our website for free. People can can download those. We also have lots of books. So the Philosophy Shop book uh, it has hundreds and hundreds of thought experiments and ideas and stories and poems and, and questions for you to just get started. And sometimes I think it's I think it's the it's important to, to get started rather than planning ahead mm. and sort of thinking about where you're going to go, because actually sometimes you need to follow where the students want to go. So you may plan on doing something on on rule breaking and then uh, the children may end up thinking about democracy instead. And, and then you have to go down a different route. You don't go down a political route rather than just a, um, an ethical one, maybe. So what's on the horizon for the uh, for the Philosophy Foundation? What's next? Uh, always more research and development. <laughs> um, so obviously we're, we're continuing to work in schools, we're continuing to reach out uh, into new new places, working with um, you know, prisons and Young Offenders Institute. Uh, but one of the things we've been working on over the last year is about helping, we're using philosophy for um, mental health and well-being. So can we help children develop emotional metacognition? Can we give them some resilience in their learning but also in their emotional lives as well. So we've been looking at that. We've got some data that uh, I'm writing up at the moment and, and analyzing that we'll be uh, hopefully publishing later on this year. Um, and then we want to do a little bit more work on that. So we're working with um, uh, with our philosophers on uh, Epicurus. So what a couple of our philosophers are writing a book on Epicurus and how he can uh, help in today's world. So we want to perhaps bring that into the classroom as well, how you know the ancient Greeks can help us think and live better. And then we'll see whether that helps children to think and live better as well. Um, so that's our sort of our main thing at the moment. We're also looking at um, working with Baroness Bennett on developing a um, an all party parliamentary group for philosophical education. So if we can get an APPG up on uh, philosophy, philosophical education throughout the whole system. So we're talking, as I said, from nursery all the way through into uh, old age. Um, we want to give everyone the opportunity to be able to philosophize and philosophize together, not just learn the history of ideas. Mm. So maybe, um, maybe a personal question then. Um, so what are you thinking uh, thinking about now? What are you reading now? What's on your desk? <laughs> I have a lot of books on my desk. Um, one of them is Hamnet, a book about Shakespeare's uh, Shakespeare's son um, and, and, uh, and his wife. It's a very good book. I highly recommend it. I think the RSC are actually turning it into a stage play at the moment, so um, catch that if you can. But I've just ordered an, uh, a book called Scripting the Moves, Cultural and cult culture and control in a no excuses charter school, which is about the charter school uh, in America, which is which came over here in the sort of form of the Harris Academies. Um, and it's a school which is built on the idea of teaching kids to follow rules. And we think, and she thinks that the author of this book, that that is not the way that 
kids should be taught because what you're doing is you're disadvantaging those who are already disadvantaged by teaching them to follow the rules. What you've got to do is teach them um, when and how to break the rules because that's what the advantaged children uh, and people know how to do. Um, I wouldn't perhaps go as far as to say teaching children how to break rules, but I would perhaps <laughs> talk about the importance of the cultural capital um, that, that comes through philosophical inquiry. If we can give children the opportunity to be able to think through ideas together and work out when something is right, when something is wrong, and know when to challenge things, then I think we're giving them something uh, for themselves and for society in the future that's really very important. I take from that, Emma, that it's never too late. If you're not philosophically inclined and you're watching this video, it's never too late to start. Never too late to start, absolutely. Come to our Think and Drinks, which we have on a Wednesday, uh, last Wednesday of every month. It's Tell a us fun more. <laughs> it's, a, it's online, it's a fun opportunity. It's an adult philosophy group where we talk about uh, any, number of, any number of things that people want to talk about. I think the one in the end of January is on music. Um, so the philosophy of music and the philosophy, um, the, the music, what, what philosophy can be brought out of music. How how are those sessions run? What what's 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 going on there? <laughs> so they're running the same way that we run our our philosophy sessions in school. So we'll uh, our facilitator will start with a question or a stimulus, um, play a piece of music perhaps, and and say to people, "Is this music? Or what is you mm. know what is free? What do they mean by freedom in this song?" Or um, and then we discuss we discuss online in in a Zoom meeting. Um, and, and people can lubricate their minds and lips with whatever they choose. <laughs> <laughs> Very nicely put. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, this was excellent, Emma. Uh, we certainly le learned a lot. Um, I'm sure Toby has as I well. I loved it. I've loved this conversation. Uh, thank you very much for your time and for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you both very much.